Let us pray. Praise and honour and glory be to you, O Christ, Son of the living God, God most high, who has created me and formed my soul after your own divine image and likeness, and had made me capable of everlasting happiness. Grant that I may serve you, my Lord, my God and my Father, with a faithful heart, that I may fight against my sins with a holy hatred, and that all sinful passion and affection being destroyed within me, I may be renewed in perfect innocence of life. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who has given me for my use the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all the things that are in them, and has granted them for my service and comfort. Permit, I beseech you, O Lord, that I may never abuse your creatures, but that all the works of your hands may tell of your goodness, and may lead me to admire, to know, and to love you. Praise and honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, out of your affection for me, granted me to be born in the true Christian faith, and has mercifully brought me up from the beginning of my life, supplying me with food and the other necessaries for the nourishment and support of my body. May my heart find no relish except in and through you. May you alone possess my innermost soul. May I exceedingly hunger for you, the bread of heaven, and thirst for you, the fountain of life, so that this life's exile ended, I may deserve to be satisfied with the joys of your eternal perfection. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who up until this time has preserved and delivered me from countless dangers of soul and body, even when I abused your gifts not deserting me. Illuminate my heart, I beseech you, with the brightness of your grace, that truly perceiving your goodness to me and my own ingratitude toward you, I may bemoan myself, I may be hateful in my own sight, but I may please you, my Creator and my only Redeemer, in all things. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when I lie immersed in the most loathsome vices and was leading a most ungodly life, in your long-suffering bore with me for such a long time and brought me to repentance. Grant that my acceptable contrition and holy works I may expiate the stains of my past sin and that from now on I may lead a life of purity and love you above all things with most burning love. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when I was on the brink of the very precipice and just within the jaws of hell, did not permit me to perish, but called me, though deaf, and trying to run from you to the way of salvation. Grant that from now on I may follow after you with humble devotion, and with a joyful heart correspond to your holy inspirations, with from my heart farewell to all things, and may cleave inseparably to you alone. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who always directed me, the vilest of sinners, has protected me, has looked upon me with the eyes of mercy, and still so fondly supports and cherishes me with your goodness, despite my daily transgressions, as if forgetful of all others. You cared for me alone. Grant that I also may love you most ardently, leaving all transitory things for your sake, and may think of you alone, and may with a ready mind and in all places follow and perform your holy will. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall sing your praise.
A reading from the Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 6. Then Jesus left that place and went to his hometown, with his disciples following him. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. Many of those who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did he get these ideas? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What are these miracles that are done through his hands? Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And so they took offence at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honour except in his hometown, and amongst his relatives and in his own house. He was not able to do a miracle there, except to lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed because of their unbelief. And he went around the villages and taught. Jesus called the twelve and began to send them out two by two. He gave them authority over unclean spirits. He instructed them to take nothing for their journey except a star. No bread, no bag, no money in their belts, and to put on sandals but not to wear two tunics. He said to them, Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the area. If a place will not welcome you or listen to you, as you go from there, shake the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. And so they went out and preached all that they should repent. They cast out many demons and appointed many sick people with oil and healed them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. After all the excitement of the previous few days, Jesus returned across the lake to the west coast, his own town of Nazareth, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath. On this particular occasion he had been asked to preach, and perhaps we have the impression that this was the first time that he had actually preached, although doubtless he had read from the scriptures there many times before. Those listening were incredulous and quickly became angry because, after all, was he not the carpenter's son? Indeed, was he not a carpenter himself? It would have been the case that Jesus would have learnt his father's trade and in all probability worked as a carpenter for a number of years before starting his ministry. And the wording of verse 3 actually suggests this. In the original Greek it is implied that he was a builder, which was then translated as carpenter in the Latin. The crowd looked across the synagogue and could see his brothers sitting there in their midst. Mary and his sisters would have been seated elsewhere with the women. Jesus turned on them and told them the well-known words that a prophet is never welcome in his own country, by his own family or in his own house. This presumably is a reflection that his brothers or half-brothers, whoever they were, were at this time sceptical of his ministry, although, as we know, they later became bastions of the early church. There are many reasons for this, the main one being that people are always resentful of those they know of old, providing any sort of moral leadership, for they can recall the misdemeanors of youth and question by what authority they consider themselves above their neighbours and able to criticise. Nevertheless, there are two thoughts that we can take away from this reading. First of all, we have the importance of young people learning a skill. It would have been easy for Jesus to have spurned learning from his father. After all, he most certainly had more important things to do. No, it was the custom at that time for all young men, regardless of their intelligence or background, 
to learn a trade. Consider Paul, who went on to become one of the most learned of the Pharisees, had grown up learning the trade of tent making. Jesus, the Son of God, learned to be a carpenter, a hard physical job, probably involving an element of travelling at that time. Not just making furniture, but being involved in house and boat building as well. How he had had to humble himself before his fellow men for our sakes. Finally, we note that even here in Nazareth, where he was ridiculed and driven from the town, it was possible for Jesus to perform a few miraculous healings. Even in a town where the crowd was predominantly hostile, there were to be found those who had faith and could be healed. And Jesus took the time to seek them out and to tend to their needs. Then there was time for the disciples to go out and put into practice some of the things that they had learnt. Obviously they were not yet fully proficient, but they knew enough to go and spread the word of Jesus throughout the land. They were also given authority to drive out unclean spirits. It is an established principle of training that practical experience be gained as a part of that training. And here we see the disciples learning how to minister to others. They went out in twos, in pairs, as one might be a companion and a witness to the other. In this way there would be no temptation to be led astray or to embellish the truth in ways that we read Paul warning us of in his letters. Quite simply, as one spoke, the other would pray, and vice versa. If one was challenged on the point, the other was there to testify as to the truth in his support. The disciples were taught to be frugal, taking with them just a stick for the journey, and the bare minimum of clothing. No money and no food. They were to rely on the charity of those they met for their needs. Likewise, where they were not welcomed, they were to move on and shake the dust from their feet as they left. This was to be a warning to those they left behind, who had rejected them. No doubt, as they set out on their journeys, their hearts were a little uneasy, and they did not know where they would be led, but, like Abraham, they set out on their paths without question, preaching that all should repent and change their lives for the better, casting out demons and healing the sick. To those who travel in faith will be given strength and courage to complete the course.
Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who hates nothing that you have made and forgives the sins of all who are penitent, create and make in us new and contrite hearts, that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may obtain of you the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We beseech you, Almighty God, look upon the hearty desires of your humble servants, and stretch forth the right hand of your majesty, to be our defence against all our enemies. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs> 